Welcome to A State of Mind, who are presenting the Axon Bulletin for the first time. My name is Paul John Dykes, and today I'm joined by Kevin Graham. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Hello, Paul. And welcome to A State of Mind Studios. What's your first impressions? Wow. Really, got the wow factor. It's definitely got the wow factor, and I've noticed that you've took the ABBA records off the turntables behind us. But no, not the ABBA. No, no, nothing wrong with ABBA. But this we is cater for all tastes, Kevin. Definitely, but this is like I remember us doing the first one in your kitchen in Dunfermline. Yes, and I remember you telling us this was what you had planned, and me going, "Ah, well, we'll see if that happens." Eh? But now we're here. It well, is. that's exactly right. You've got to have the plans, haven't you? You've got to have the plans, Kevin. So within a year, we were voted the UK's best football podcast. A couple of years later, and we've been nominated for best international podcast because, and I think this is the reason, it was a Scottish podcast that had won it for three years running. Mm-hmm. So they've created a new category that both ourselves and Open Go and various other podcasts are in. So that is going to be announced in November, and it would be great if a Celtic State of Mind were to regain that title. Do you remember the first conversation that we had? Because a lot of folk actually do think that we were friends before... I all, thought we were, Kev. No, before all of this started up, eh? And come driving down here in the car, I, I was thinking about that, the first conversation that we had, and we never spoke about football for the whole hour we were on the phone. That's right. We spoke about McHead. Yes. For, for the majority of the conversation. For any of the listeners who are not aware of Michael Head, he's a Liverpool musician who has been the front man of bands such as The Pale Fountains and Shack. He's now a solo artist with the Red Elastic Band. So a favourite of mine and also of Kevin's, a Celtic state of mind, if you've not already figured out, do like to speak to and about other subjects relating to culture, sport, art, film, etc. And a state of mind is going to cover that in far more detail, Kevin. But today we're going to do our first bulletin. This is going to be a regular feature on a Celtic state of mind this season. Uh, What I would like to start off by asking you is, we've trimmed the squad. A few, what you would maybe describe as squad players, have got some game time during the pre-season. I'm thinking Klamala, Sorrow, and people were impressed with Connell at the weekend there. Are these guys going to be appearing as a cliched, like a new signing? Are they going to be guys that, you know, they've been there for a few months, in Connell's uh, case, a whole year, but they're going to feel like a new signing? Well, what Celt- for me, what Celtic usually do is they buy players who, to make an impact, not right away, but to make an impact in 6 to 12 months. So you look at Sorrow, you look at Kamala, I, I expected them to be in and about the team, round about now. To, they've had their six month bedding in period under extremely difficult circumstances right enough but they've had that bedding in period they've now had a pre-season with a squad and it has been like a old school pre-season that they've had because usually it's the three weeks and we're into the European qualifiers I thought you meant old school as in running up and doing sand dunes and up and doing a terrace and it looks as though Klamala has done a lot more than he, that he's done a lot in lockdown eh so you would expect them to actually then of, of, to be integrated into the first team squad and it looks like they have Kamala especially obviously when the picture of him hit the internet built up looking like a legend or so ultra has he, he jumped up in front of Lee Griffiths for you is he the second choice striker now no it's still Lee Griffiths Lee Griffiths yesterday against Hibs for me proved if you dangle a carrot in front of Lee Griffiths he's going to bite it and Lee Griffiths will do what Lee Griffiths wants to do. And if he feels his position is in threat, then he'll step up to the mark. And for me, Lee Griffiths is 29. He's experienced. He knows the football club. He knows what's expected in the Scottish League. He's a proven goal scorer in the Scottish League. He is our second choice striker. And no one, uh, if we bring in another striker, which could be likely... Lee Griffiths is still the number two striker. Lee Griffiths would walk into any other team in Scotland. Oh yeah, absolutely. We'll come back to Sorrow and Connell then, now that we're on the subject to Lee Griffiths. Let's talk about what's happened during the pre-season and the comments made by Neil Lennon, who up until that point I had praised for his management, Lee Griffiths, getting him back into the side, getting him back into the goals, if you like, last season, at the end of last season. He came out, he was quite vocal about being unhappy with Lee's conditioning and he refused to take him over to France. Now, he's responded... So is that just brilliant man management by Neil Lennon? Without knowing the ins and outs, we do not know the ins and outs. We do not know the character of Lee Griffiths. What you would have to say is Neil Lennon knows how to handle Lee Griffiths. 
knows that that public put down was going to get the reaction that he wanted. And his half hour yesterday against Hibs looked like it had got the reaction that he wanted. Lee Griffiths, when he was out for the game, for that period, for whatever, with issues that he did have, people were going, oh, it's a shame and a waste of talent. Lee Griffiths has been Lee Griffiths, and you've got to manage Lee Griffiths. And what that actually means, for me, only in my opinion, is you're going to need to put up with him sometimes not doing as you ask. But you need to bring him back into line. But great man management at the same time by Neil Lennon. Definitely. I'm, yeah. I'm going to say definitely. He's not yeah. just throwing him on a scrap heap, is no. he? No. So you're talking there about a player who it's worth the foibles because of what you get. And I'm not comparing them, but the Cantona thing with Ferguson allowing him to get away with a lot more than other players because he repaid you with performances and match-winning performances. It's a fine line. If you let him get away with too much, other players are going to then start trying to get away with too much. But if the manager is just reiterating that this is a level that you must be at to play for Celtic Football Club, then it's fantastic. It's just shown the players in that dressing room, this player here can score us 30 goals a season. But if he's not willing to do as we ask... He won't play. He won't play. Yeah, and that goes back to the conversation with Mark Wilson last week where I was speaking about high-profile stroke flair players like Gravison, Donati, Wyrden, and Wilson confirmed it had nothing to do with attitude if you're not as conditioned and hard-working as the others in the team Strachan wouldn't play you. So it's, it's in that, that kind of mode as well. And obviously, Lennon has worked with Strachan, so I'm pretty sure he'll have picked up one or two things from that period. When we go to the other strikers then that we currently have, if you're thinking Klamala's come back out of the wilderness, if you like, I would suggest he's now maybe even second choice, certainly third choice, Bio, is it time to let him go out on loan? It looks that way. He's never really done anything to show that he's got potential. The thing about Kamala is that you can see when he gets the ball into him, he's got a touch, he's got a technique, he's got a game awareness, he's got a work rate. He, he thrives on space, he's always on the last man. He's always looking for that space. I've never seen that in Bio. He seems a bit, Bio seems a bit clumsy on the ball, a bit he doesn't know. I mean, obviously he has played at a top level, but is he conditioned enough? He seems to be injured quite a lot. He's never featured this pre-season whatsoever. So you've got to maybe say at this point, then maybe a loan to another Scottish team might do him good, give him game times. He's not going to get a game at Celtic. No, I'd agree with that. The other players I mentioned before, Sorrow, we didn't really know much about him. Have you been impressed from what you've seen now? I like he covers the ground well. One of the criticisms I had of him yesterday when I was watching the game was that he played the ball back. A simple ball, he keep possession quite a bit when there was a forward ball on. That changed in the setting half, but then that might just come. That might come when he gets used to the teammates round about him, gets used to the way that we play. We need to move the ball quick. If we don't move the ball quick from the position that Sorrow plays, then teams just fall back, get into a shape. Stop us being expansive, stop us turning them. So he needs to move the ball quicker. Uh, I noticed Neil Lennon was saying that there's certain aspects of the game that he can improve. I think that's one of the aspects as well. And he looks like he's got a wee bit of a nasty streak in him as well. He likes he likes putting a, a, a challenge in like here and there. Yep. And obviously we've got Brown in that position. We've got to maybe start having a look at the, game, the number of games that Bruni plays. And you've maybe seen that in pre-season already where he played one, rested for one. So we're, we're maybe looking for guys to step into that in the domestic games. Succession planning, Kevin. And Luke O'Connell came in. We know much of a fanfare from Bolton Wanderers last pre-season. What, what's your thoughts been on Luke O'Connell? his vision yesterday against Hibs. His vision, one touch, bang, one touch, bang. He could see a pass, he played the pass. Guys like Griffiths and Kamala will, and, and Edward will thrive on that. Someday it plays an early ball. The strikers need an early ball because teams sit deep. And Connell yesterday especially looked like that was part of his game. Part of his game was take one touch in the space with it. There, there was no messing about. There was no taking two, three touches. Direct. Uh, direct. Something that Lennon spoke about quite quite a lot. Well, being ever direct, since he's come in, eh? uh, being, ever since being he's more come back direct in. than what Rogers was, yep. where possession was king. We seem to be, and I love it. I love us taking the chances. I love us being a bit more chaotic. 
as long as we win and get the ball back, as long as we play with energy, as long as we're expansive, as long as we just don't keep possession for keeping possession's sake. Mm -hmm. I, I really do like a player like Connell. He, he's got that... It's the same with Robertson, it was the same with Henderson and Lee Dembele as well. They all look comfortable on the ball. We produce good technically looking football players yep. who have got great close control that can get themselves out of trouble and can also create with getting themselves out of that trouble. It's the wee flicks, it's the turns. connell got that as well. But it's then you have to... It's easy enough doing it in development football, but you've got to do it, for want of a better word, you've got to do it in man's football. You've got to do it in competitive football. Mm -hmm. You've got to do it when the chips are down. And this is where the players are. Will the management take the risk of keeping the, those players in there to perform, develop? They yep. develop. They need to develop. I want them to develop at Celtic Football Club. Now, that brings up the big dilemma. Do you have the room to allow people to develop when you're going for 10 in a row? And we'll come back to that in a moment. But before we go on to that subject, Kevin, I noticed you're wearing a, a natty retro Celtic jersey. Now, is this one of the remakes or was this bought back in 1995? This was bought two days before the 1995 Scottish Cup final and it still fits me. Are you deliberately hiding the sponsor there? Uh, no, I think that's just... Jerry Eady might want a wee bit of sponsorship. There we go. Jerry Eady wants a wee bit of sponsorship. There we go. Right, so who's the first player you think of when you look at that jersey? Van Hoydonk. Pierre Van Hoydonk scored the winner, of course, against the Adrianians uh, and one nothing win. Great pass by Tosh McKinley. And my favourite part about that, that shirt was the collar, with the hooped collar. Mm -hmm. And it was at a time where a lot of people were wearing it up. I think Di Canio wore that collar up. So one of the favourite jerseys of the, the Celtic match one jersey collection, would you say? It is now. It brings back fond memories of Tommy Burns' team. And I remember when it came out, everybody was going, oh, look at all the detail on the hoops and it, it spoils it and all of that. But when you look back on it now, you go, that was a cracking kit. I'm quite impressed that it still fits you. I've also, also noticed you've got some pin badges. And just to confirm, a Celtic state of mind will not be producing pin badges like the 5,000 other companies that currently are. But you've got Henrik Larson on one breast and Ian Brown on another. Both celebrating in similar stances there. We'll get on to Ian Brown in our next podcast because if you can let the viewers know what the next Scream of Selica is going to be. The next Scream of Selica podcast is going to be, I don't know why it's took us so long to get round to doing this album, but it's the Stone Roses debut album. I don't know why it's took us so long to tell you the truth. Maybe it was too obvious. I think it was maybe too obvious for us to try and start off with. Right. Uh, it feels like a good time to actually do it for yeah, some And a good day, a good yeah. day to do it as well. May 1989 that was released mm -hmm. and it's grown and grown ever since now. Kevin, you mentioned a couple of the younger players within the squad and the question's been asked, with us trimming the squad, with less players possibly coming in, will youth be given a chance? And then going back to one of the points you made there, there's a massive step up from the development style football to the, the first team and we've seen players like Mikey Johnson who has shown flashes of brilliance but then you know he's picked up a lot of injuries on the other side of the pitch Frimpong came in like a like a burst from nowhere and then he got sussed out pretty quickly changed his game a wee bit do you think that's going to be something that Connell would need to be aware of? Definitely he would need to we need to be aware of in the midfields in Scotland it's not a place for the faint hearted you will get guys who are on top of you right away and his style of play maybe lends itself to he will only take too many touches of the ball you look at that game yesterday Olivier and Cham best player in the park again again he was the best player in the park against PSG he's a quality but even sometimes he gets bogged down by the workman like nature of Scottish football and Connell maybe being British he's a scouser played for Bolton I mean, we've got to remember he played first team games yep. for Bolton in a very very tough league mm -hmm. a very very physical league so the step up might not be as difficult for Connell as what it might be for say Scott Robertson who what about Dembele Dembele as well but Dembele's too good to go on loan ah certainly uh, when uh, you put him out on loan uh, uh, my concern is the physicality the size of him well, at 17 the size of him at 17 but then I'm sure at training he's getting the, the physical nature of the game against bigger guys I'm sure he doesn't they don't let him off in training he needs games with us I wouldn't put him out on loan. I would want to see him getting games with us. And it was interesting yesterday. I, I'm, you know me, I'm not really one for tactics. I'm not really one for f formations. But I did notice that he moved inside and played a sort of number 10 role or deep lying playmaker, as I would call it. And it suited him. And mm -hmm. he got a couple of nudges in the back as well. 
he is small, he is slight, but you look at Kieran Tierney, when he broke into the team, he, he, he was skinny. He came back the following season, he had bulked up. So it's quite easy to do for guys with the time and the advice. And as you're getting a disclaimer in at the end, there, eh? saying it's easy to be conditioned. You're just getting a disclaimer in there. Definitely. Let's talk about some signings then. We've obviously brought El Yunusi back in. He was a bit of a favourite of mine last season. Our statistician told us the stats didn't match up, but we obviously got him back in on loan. I'm happy with that. Where else are we going to strengthen? It looks as though the Foster deal is dead. It looks like we're going to bring in our striker. We definitely need another goalkeeper and it, by all the reports, not that we've got any inside information, it looks like the guy for Athens is the signing that, that we are going to get. Right, how will that narrative play out? I'm sure the papers will probably say, oh, we've lost our first choice target, which was Big Fraser. I would have loved Big Fraser back, but for me, an outsider looking in, he's went back to Southampton and his agents told him to sit tight, see, wait for the Premiership season to finish, see who gets promoted. Mm-hmm. And he was going to need to take a hell of a wage cut to come to Celtic. And yeah. that, that's maybe something that his agent is not willing to do. You're spot on there. And when you're talking about forward players, there was a tweet that caused a bit of a flurry from Tam McManus talking about Stephen Fletcher being fit and rearing it to go and come up and uh, he's bought a house in Glasgow. Would you entertain that? Of course I would. I, I would entertain somebody like Fletcher as a fourth choice striker at Celtic to come off the bench in League Cup games and to get starts. Better option in bio? Definitely. Yeah. No argument. No argument. And uh, a jetty or a jetty seems I, to be the guy that's uh, paper talk at the moment coming along. Again, you look at El Hussi. Both of these players were on their radar mm-hmm. before they made the move to Bao. Yeah. As soon as they go to Bao, they go, all of a sudden they're out of price range. They're young players, still developing players who have had moves that don't work out. And that's the market that we're, we're in. And if we're going to get a player that was worth eight million last summer or whenever he signed for West Ham United, who our scouting system knows very, very well, to bring him up for a season, try before you buy, I didn't see any problem in that whatsoever. Right now, when we're looking at the preseason games that we've seen already, I don't know if you've tuned in any of the English football, Kevin. It's no for me. I've not watched any of that. What's your thoughts on football without the fans? Football should not start before fans are allowed back in the stadiums. It's very clear with the leagues that have finished in this COVID-19 situation that it was contractual and it is very weird watching a game from Celtic Park way when they're piping and come on your boys in green onto the park. Football should only start when it's safe enough for fans to come back. Other than that, it's just a box ticking exercise. Of course, I'll be in my living room or here or wherever I'm going to watch the games, jumping about when we score, getting very animated, but it's not the same without the, the fans in the park, in the ground. Even the players will tell you that, the referees will tell you that, the managers will tell you that. Of course. It's not the same. And the quicker we can get some fans back into the stadium, the better. I mean, we've already played in France where there was 5,000 allowed. Mm-hmm. Some Celtic fans went to France, fair play to all of them. Fantastic, I love that, I actually do love that. I've watched a bit of the Danish leagues and the Norwegian leagues, which are shown on Eurosport. Copenhagen had 11,000 at their final home game of the season. Right. And what an atmosphere. Mm-hmm. What a great atmosphere, 11,000 in that. I don't think it was 50% of their capacity, but 11,000 in that stadium generated a fantastic atmosphere. Right. It would be the same at Celtic Park. Oh, they would generate, of course they would, they would generate a much better atmosphere than what it will be on Sunday on the opening day against Halton. It's going to be strange coming up against Halton and going for 10 in a row without the fans being there and with socially distant huddles and all that kind of stuff, Kevin. And my biggest concern is a bigger one than that. It's a wider issue. Even with the COVID testing being doubled, for example, that just adds even more financial stress on a lot of the smaller clubs. The 10 in a row for me isn't about what's going to happen on the pitch, it's whether or not the games will get played. So is that still a concern for you? It is a concern because I do I do think that there's going to be localised lockdowns. I think that's already been proved, proven all over Europe that there's going to be localised lockdowns and you could get games that, that are cancelled because there's a, a break, a breakout in that area. When we get into winter and we start spending more and more times indoors, it could be as well that there's another nationwide lockdown as well. So that that's basically my worry. 
that the games you might end up with a backlog of games. You might end up having to play four games a week at one point. The fans might get shut out again at one point during the season. For me, UEFA, what UEFA should have done was at Christmas they should have had the Euro Championships at Christmas and all leagues should have started in 2021, in February 2021, and go to a summer calendar. That, 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 would, that would have been my solution. And as long as the clubs could have got funding to take them up to that point, that's what should have been done. I think we're starting too early. We're starting too early because fans are not allowed in the stadium. And for me, fans should have been the biggest consideration here, no the telecompanies. What about the future of the clubs? Getting the season tickets out there, getting them sold. Understand that. Surviving. I, I, I understand that. There would have been, there has been, have been a phenomenal amount of goodwill to football clubs eh, from the fans, but there should have been a, form, a phenomenal amount of goodwill from the richer clubs, from the organisations that run football to make sure that clubs survive. So there you go. There's the thoughts of Kevin Graham on the very first Axon Bulletin. This is going to be a regular feature as we go throughout the season on uh, State of Mind. So thank you all for joining us. Please subscribe to A Celtic State of Mind on Spreaker, iTunes or any podcast player that you use. Go over to YouTube and subscribe to us on there as well. And we'll see you next time for the Axon Bulletin. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.